I titled this, this message, sermon, talk, whatever you want to call it, I titled it Face to Face with Jesus, A Woman, Her Sin, and Her Choice. Last week and the week before, I made the statement that Jesus is right there wherever you are. He's right there. Just as good as that statement is the fact that wherever you're going, he's already there waiting for you. I, I don't know about you, but I, I really take <coughs> great hope and pleasure in that. He's already there. I hope you thank you for heart. I hope you heard everything I said. But please don't miss this important fact. Jesus is there waiting for you wherever you go. I hope this has an impact on your life, that simple fact. Not only comfort us when we're going through things, but also I think as a reminder that wherever we are or whatever we're doing or thinking about doing, Jesus is there. I don't know if I really take, I shouldn't say, if I were to really take that to heart, it should stop me from doing some of the things I do or going some of the places I go or saying some of the things I say. Knowing that Jesus is there already. Read through the Gospels, and I think you'll be surprised at how many people that Jesus ministered to actually came to where he already was. We read that in the scripture this morning. He was in the temple already, and the people came. They gathered around him. Jesus was there then. He was here two weeks ago. He was here last week. He's here today. <coughs> Jesus is here waiting to meet with us. I really think we need to hang on to this. And we need to encourage other people with that statement. Over the past several weeks, we have a really good friend. We take, prayed for her, and it was Pat. And Tish has had the opportunity to share with her. And I love my wife. She is a creative writer. And she's been writing little notes, little stories. Each week has its own story. One week she was in the Coliseum fighting the, all the different things. This week she was a, she was a, a, a Star Trek traveler fighting the, the things. And, uh, Tish is laughing and she's pretty much saying, oh, you have to say that. But the whole point is, no matter what she wrote to this woman, she encouraged her that Jesus was right there with her, going through the radiation treatments, going through all these treatments. And that's what I hope to encourage you with, that he's here with us today. He's here with you when you leave. He's here with you when you go. He's with you. Last week, I, one of the other things I said, and I'll say it again now, and I probably will say it as long as I have breath. Is that no matter where you are, no matter what you're doing, when you come face to face with Jesus, you have to make a choice. You have to make a choice. It doesn't have to be a life and death situation. It doesn't have to be an earth shattering, shattering situation. But you will, at some point, come face to face to Jesus, with Jesus, maybe even today. And you have to make a choice. You can either believe that he is who he says he is, the Son of God, God the Son, or not. Simple choices, but you'll have to make them. You can accept all that he has to offer. Salvation, forgiveness of sins, peace with God, eternity with him, or not. It's your choice. But I hope you understand and know this. You will have to make a decision. Even no decision is a decision. When you come face to face with Jesus, you have to make a decision. And think about it, and check it out for yourself. Almost everyone who came in contact with Jesus in scriptures had to make a choice. Some chose wisely, some did not. The scribes, the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, they had to make a choice. Herod, the so-called king of the Jews, when he came face to face with Jesus, he had to make a choice. Even Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor who sentenced him to death, had to make a choice. Now think about this. They were presented with the exact same Jesus and the same choices as Peter, Andrew, John, and the rest of the disciples. They were the same, met the same Jesus and talked to the same Jesus as Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. They saw the same Jesus the Maniac saw on the water of the well that we talked about last week. They had to make a choice. And not to belabor the fact, but we have to make a choice too. And before you leave here this morning, you'll have to make a choice. Each and every time we come face to face with Jesus, we have to make a choice. 
And if you haven't already made a choice to follow Jesus and become one of his disciples, I hope that you will. And you'll choose wisely and choose life. Last week I talked about the Samaritan woman who was at the well and met Jesus. <coughs> this week I want to spend just a little bit of time talking about another woman. We read about her. She had the opportunity to make, meet Jesus, although based on the surface, circumstances, I'm sure she would much rather have passed up on that opportunity. And that's something else I want us to think about. Jesus often shows up in our lives when we least expect him, when we need him most, and sometimes when we least want to face him. And we just want to say, I'm not ready today, Jesus. I don't want to talk to you. I'm in a bad place. I don't want to be there. But Jesus still shows up. And some background I've already touched on it a little bit. The Feast of Tents or Tabernacles had just been celebrated. It was at the end. It was celebrating God's goodness to the Jewish people during their 40 years in the desert. And we know it was at the end because in John chapter 7, verse 37, this is the last day the climax of the festival had occurred. <coughs> now since there weren't any train depots or bus stations or highways or airports, I'm sure it's, there were a good amount of people still left, still left in Jerusalem, still left hanging around. I'm also sure that there were some people who just wanted to get up to the temple one more time before they head home. And we're told in the scripture, early the next morning, he, being Jesus, was back at the temple. Think about that. He was there before everybody got there. What was he doing then? He was waiting for everybody to come. That's a physical sense of what I've been talking about. Jesus was there and he was waiting. He was probably there before the temple priests, probably before, before the guards, probably before the Pharisees, and definitely before the people. But an interesting thing happens. Wherever Jesus shows up, wherever he is or was, a crowd shows up. And we're told that in scripture. A crowd soon gathered and he sat down and taught them. And I can't help but wonder if these aren't those people who really wanted to be there. It's early in the morning, early in the day. Jesus is there. People start hanging around. He starts talking to them. I wonder if it, these people are with, were there or aren't kind of like the people who show up at church in the middle of a snowstorm. And they're there because they want to be there. I already mentioned for some, I'm sure for some, they had already begin, some had already begun to make their way home. But I'm just as sure that there were others who wanted to come to the temple just one more time. And scripture tells us in verse 3, as he was speaking, the teachers of the religious law and Pharisees brought a woman they had caught in the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd. And I've already said, I think most people wanted to be there. But I sincerely doubt this woman wanted to be there. I doubt she wanted to be in the temple. I doubt she wanted to be in front of the scribes, Pharisees, and teachers of the law. And knowing Jesus' reputation, I doubt that she wanted to be in front of Jesus. <laughs> and yet here, can you picture the, the commotion that's going on? Can you picture what's happening? Jesus is sitting down, as was the custom, and he's teaching. And all of a sudden, this commotion starts. And maybe as you can hear it at the edge of the crowd, it starts getting, and the crowd starts parting. And here comes, here comes these religious teachers. I imagine them coming in with their robes just swirling all around, maybe some perspiration and sweat, because they're dragging this woman. I don't picture this woman as coming willingly. They're dragging her. I can almost hear them shouting, clear a path. We've caught us a sinner. And we're going to have her judge right here and now. Scripture doesn't say it, but I can almost hear this woman protesting and yelling her innocence, pleading her case to no avail. I think she had to know at this very moment she was literally just a stone's throw away from an unpleasant death. Now here's just a little side note I want to share with you. I wonder if that woman who had apparently decided to commit a sin instead of adultery, ever expected to be caught in her sin. Think about it. When we sin, we don't expect to be caught. Did she ever in her wildest dreams expect that if she was caught in this particular sin, that it would be so flagrantly exposed? Maybe she'd have to sort of crawl away in the middle of the night. But how could she expect it to be exposed like this? 
And even worse, some historians and commentators, I just read this recently, that just was told this, feel that since she was caught in the act of adultery, there's a good chance she was naked. Can you picture this woman? Caught in her sin, totally and completely exposed. Talk about your sins being found out. Better. And if she were caught, was she thinking she'd be put to death for her actions? I think the truth of is, the truth is, most if not all of us, when we do things that we know we shouldn't do, and I think every one of us can say that we've been there, let's call it what it is when we sin, I don't think any of us expect to be caught. I really don't. I mean, when was the last time you did them? Maybe you haven't. Maybe you're a whole lot better than me. Maybe the last time you told a white lie, if there is such a thing, did you expect to be caught? You know, maybe you reached into your husband's wallet and you took out a ten dollar bill without telling him. And maybe that's your what you do normally. But did you expect to be caught? We don't do things. The robber, the rapist, the murderer, they don't expect to be caught. The child that takes a cookie without telling or lies to their parents don't expect to be caught. I think if we did expect to be caught, we probably wouldn't do the things we do, or at least not as much. How often have you done something thinking that no one will notice, no one will care, and even if they'll do, there'll be plenty of time to reprint. There'll be plenty of time to say, I'm sorry. How often have we justified our actions by saying or thinking that things that we're doing are just not that bad? I already mentioned a little white lie. So I wonder also if this woman who was caught in the act of adultery, even knowing the penalty for her transgressions, ever expected that her punishment be so, so, so severe. Even though the punishment is exactly what is demanded. In Romans chapter 8, verse 23, we're told the wages of sin is death. That's the punishment for sin. It doesn't put it on a scale top to bottom. It just says the wages of sin is death. And that's the fact that ultimately all sin leads to death. Whether we get we expect to get caught or whether we sneak by under the radar, unrepentant sin requires death. The Jewish law required that anybody caught in the act of adultery be put to death. Jewish law said that this woman now be put to death. And that's what the Pharisees and the teachers were demanding of Jesus at that moment. Because in verse 4 they said, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? What do you say? But listen, these leaders weren't really interested in justice. They weren't really interested in seeing this woman stoned. They didn't really care. What they were doing was trying to lay a trap for Jesus. If Jesus said, go ahead and stone her, he'd be violating Roman law because they didn't have the authority to kill somebody. If he, if he said not to, he'd be violating Jewish law, which said a woman caught in this act needed to be stoned. And I think the religious leaders of the day, and this is something we don't know, and just reading into the different scriptures, I don't know if they misinterpreted it more or if they just haven't brought all the facts out. Because if you would go back to Deuteronomy and Leviticus, one of the, the only person that was to be literally, people caught in adultery in, in Leviticus and Deuteronomy were supposed to be put to death. But only, only the betrothed woman or engaged woman who was caught in the act of adultery in a city was specifically supposed to be stoned. And the reason for that was the law said that she had the opportunity to cry out for help, and she didn't cry out. And if you want to look back at that, look in Deuteronomy 22 and Leviticus 20. But anyway, can you imagine the scene? A scared, squirming, possibly naked woman. She, I picture tears streaming down her face, breathing rapid, eyes wide open. I imagine she's terrified at this moment. She realizes how close she is to death. And then there were the religious leaders. I can almost see their snide grins as they rubbed their hands together and perhaps even said to each other, we got him now. We got him. What's he going to do now? So what does Jesus do? He knows the law. 
He probably could have debated it with him and, and also asked about the man, who, by the way, is not present. That's something everybody always asks. Well, where's the guy? It takes two to commit adultery. But see, they weren't interested in justice. They were interested in trapping Jesus. <coughs> Jesus probably could have also made a case for mercy. But what does he do? Verse 6 tells us he stooped down and wrote the dust with his finger. I don't think anybody expected that. An interesting thing to remember, though, is Jesus does not have to act in that very rarely does act in the way we expect him to. So instead of making a statement, he seemingly ignores everyone and starts to write in the dust. Have you ever wondered what he was writing if you've heard this story? Well, unfortunately, John doesn't tell us. But some, some people suggest maybe he was writing the Ten Commandments. Maybe he was just doodling in the dust and giving everybody a time to stew in their own juices. I wonder if perhaps his reluctance to speak wasn't giving everybody an opportunity to reevaluate what's going on. To step back and take a breath. And here's another aside. If the woman was naked, maybe he would stoop down with his face to the dust to give her a little bit of dignity without looking at her. And that's, these are all things we don't know. And I know there's been times in my own life when I was sure that Jesus was ignoring me. I was sure he just didn't hear what I was asking him. Maybe he was writing in the sand. I have to tell you, I don't want to wait. I don't like waiting. waiting. I'm a very impatient person. I want an answer and I want it now. I don't know if any of the rest of you are like that, but that's me. And the Pharisees were like this because Scripture tells us they kept demanding an answer of him. <coughs> you know, here's another funny thing. When you, when you start to demand that Jesus answer you, when you start to demand that Jesus do this or do that or tell you this or tell you that, he does. Unfortunately, when he does, it's often an answer we don't like. I think this happens with the Pharisees and the other leaders because Jesus stands up in the New Living Translation and says, all right, stoner. That's how it says in the New Living Translation. He stood up and said, all right, stoner. Can you hear that? Wow. He just nailed himself. He said that we should stoner. He's going to go to jail. He's going to be thrown in a Roman prison. But he puts a little caveat on that. A little catch. Because he said, but let those who have never sinned throw the first stone. The New International Version says it like this, if any of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. So how often have we been quick to judge someone while forgetting that like them, we too are sinners in need of forgiveness? I think this is what Jesus is reminding these leaders. That they're just as much sinners as this woman. If you're without sin, go ahead, throw the stone. And verse 8 tells us again, he stooped down and, and wrote on the ground. And I've heard a preacher speak on this before. Actually, I've heard several preachers say this and read it in a commentary. And some think that Jesus may have been writing, stooping down on the ground and writing the sins of each Pharisee. Again, it's something we don't know. We don't know what he was writing, but it's nice conjecture, thinking that Jesus knows everything. I wonder if maybe he wrote in a song that wrote from Proverbs. Who can say I have kept my heart pure that I am clean without sin? <coughs> Proverbs chapter 12. <coughs> the truth is, I said it before, I'll say it again. We don't know what Jesus was writing. Maybe he was nothing. Maybe he was just giving a woman a bit of dignity by not staring at her. But coming face to face with Jesus, demanding an answer from him, demanding that a choice be made. These men could have stolen the woman. She was seemingly guilty as charged. But in order to do that, they would have publicly announced that they are superior to her and publicly say, I'm without sin. Isn't it interesting? When confronted with their own sinfulness, they all walked away. We're told when the accusers heard this, they all slipped away one by one beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with this woman. Listen, after all the accusations have been made, after all the dust settles, 
the bottom line is that we are once again left face to face with Jesus and face to face with our own sinfulness. Jesus now has a simple question for this woman. Where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? Have you ever had to come face to face with the sin in your life? Have you ever had to come face to face with something you did, said, or thought, especially in the face of a holy God, knowing that God was standing there? She could have used this opportunity to plead her case. She could have said, listen, Jesus, I was never really guilty. The charges were trumped up. And if I were guilty, where is the man I was supposed to be with? But we don't read this. Instead, when asked, where are your accusers, does anyone condemn you? She says, no, Lord. One translation says, no, sir. And I think it's, it's important we understand this moment, because in this simple response, I believe that she's at once acknowledging the sovereignty and lordship of Jesus. The New International says, maybe in your Bible, it has served with a small s, but that word is translated from the Hebrew, that word for Lord or Yahweh which is the proper name of God. And I believe the bottom line is this, is when confronted with her sinfulness, confronted face to face with Jesus, she acknowledges his lordship, and in so doing seems to acknowledge that any forgiveness can only come from him. <clears throat> I love Jesus' response to her. He said, and to us also, he simply says, neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your, leave your life of sin. The Living Translation says, go and sin no more. Can you picture Jesus looking at this woman and not seeing the sin, but seeing the sinner who needs forgiveness? This woman's sin demanded death. Don't ever forget that our sin demands the same thing. The Pharisees, the woman, probably even the crowd expected justice. What they saw from Jesus was mercy. And what this woman received was simple, unmerited grace. When Jesus says, go and sin no more, that's exactly what he's given her. He's given her grace. He's given her forgiveness. He's shown her mercy. And in so doing, he does the same thing for us. He's telling, yes, I know you've sinned, but you can be forgiven. The ball is now in this woman's court. She's been face to face with Jesus. She acknowledged him as Lord, and she had her immediate sin forgiven. But the question is, what will she do? Will she sin no more, or will she go back to a sinful life? We don't know. What we do know is that she had a choice. At that very moment in time, she was given a choice. Forgiveness and a choice to sin no more. We too have a choice. We have that same choice. We read it last week and the week before from 1 John verse 1 9. If we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just and to, uh, to forgive and to cleanse us from every wrong. All we have to do is confess that we're sinners and tell him we're sorry and he'll forgive us. So the final question I have is what will you choose? Well, you make no mistake. You do have to choose. Even by not choosing, you choose. Let's pray. Father, I am so grateful for your mercy. The mercy that we don't deserve. Our sins require death, according to your word. Our sins require separation from a holy God. And yet you show us mercy. You tell us to come, to come and find forgiveness, to come and find hope, to come and find peace, to come. You tell us to come and just repent, to confess that yes, we are sinners, and to find that forgiveness. Lord, I pray for each and every person here this morning, Lord, whether they understand that they've come face to face with Jesus, it has nothing to do with me, it has to do with your word. Your true and faithful word to us, Lord. 
We can't read your word. We can't hear from your word and say that we haven't been given a choice because we have. And Lord, it's a choice that each one of us has to make for ourselves. A father or a mother can't make it for their child. A husband or a wife can't make it for their spouse. We have to make it for ourselves. And Lord, I pray for each person here this morning, starting with myself, that we would choose wisely and that we would do it with your help and your strength. I ask you in Christ's name. Amen. Our final song.